Have you noticed that facial recognition is everywhere at the moment? It's how we unlock our phones, tag people on Facebook, and at some US airports, it's been used to speed up the process of boarding an aircraft. But there are also concerns about this technology as well from lawmakers and civil rights groups. I'm here with Gretchen Green, a computer vision expert and lawyer who's going to help us understand this technology. Thank you for joining us, Gretchen. Hi, Tom. Great to be here. The uses that are really um, driving the public debate right now are around the government uses. And so we've seen the, the city of San Francisco, where we are now, recently banned use of facial recognition by its agencies. Uh, Oakland, across the bay, uh, did so too, and so did Somerville, Massachusetts. It's very unusual for a government at any level to completely ban a technology. What, what's driving, driving this? Right. So one of the uses, or maybe the primary use that I think drives that is law enforcement's use. And so besides it borders, it's also local government. You've seen it on TV episodes, right, where on crime shows they can just you know, sort of search and it's like, oh, that's who that is. One of the issues is how that intersects with overall surveillance possibilities. The thing which is unprecedented right now is the number of surveillance cameras, both private and public. If you were to connect those into a network where it was easy to get that data in a continuous way, and then you combine it with tools like facial recognition that could allow the automated processing of the data, you could track everyone, potentially, all of the time, backwards to as far as you had surveillance data. Now, we're not there, but if you've got a camera, there's still the question of can the police get a search warrant or can they just ask you for it? Tell us a little bit about this technology. So how does, how does it work and how are these systems being, being made? Ultimately, what it does is it's finding patterns. And there's multiple layers that are finding different kinds of patterns. But you can imagine with your eyes that if you really simplified it, so you zoomed way out and you had this blurry image, there's kind of a dark band right here. So that's in one of the layers, one of the patterns that the model is picking up. And then you have to give it examples of pictures that you've labeled. Either it can be a yes, no, there's a face in the picture, there's not. Or it can be where the face is, or it can be who the face is. And it might be millions of examples that you need to give it for it to figure out what are the patterns that it should be looking for. Where does that data come from? Well, it depends, actually, on who's using it. Where does government get images? Mm -hmm. So I would say government databases, departments of motor vehicle, state department records, those kinds of records are starting to be assembled into databases that the FBI, for instance, has access to. Not all states, but some. Where does big tech get images from as a primary source? Well, people post them all the time. I said what you would need is a picture of someone mm -hmm. and a label that said, who is this? So if you put up a picture or you see a picture and you say, oh, well, this is my friend Jack and this is my friend Sue. Now you've provided them that labeled training data that they can use for their facial recognition algorithms. It's also gotten much more accessible. So not only the big tech companies with deep pockets and a lot of scientists can do this sort of thing. Um, so it's been proliferating. Absolutely. They're showing up in a lot of different places, commercial, all kinds of uses. How are they being used? Private security. So it's being used at large events. There was a report in China about someone who had an outstanding warrant or the equivalent going to a big concert and being identified by facial recognition. It's being used for advertisements. A closely related technology is emotion recognition, um, which can be done in a lot of ways, but one of them is through looking at the face. So if you can see how someone reacts to an electronic billboard outside a store, you can change the electronic billboard to try to make it more enticing to them. It's also being used in education with robot-human interactions. Having a robot that has like a nice personality but trying to interact, and so it has to understand when someone is looking at it. So yeah, so a really broad span, and, and lots of them seem fairly innocuous. Some of them, I guess, may seem a bit unusual. We don't expect billboards to to scan our faces or look at us. And, and why, why does the government want this technology? So in, in law enforcement, for example, what, what benefits do they see from having the ability to, to search faces in a database? Law enforcement is interested in tools to help them do their job better. If you've got a database full of pictures and their identities, and then you have a picture of somebody from the 7-Eleven that got robbed, right now you would take that picture and maybe pass it around to the officers who do work in that area, 
you'd maybe go around the neighborhood, say, does anybody know who this is? Well, one, that'll take longer. But the other thing is, maybe nobody knows. And maybe that picture is somewhere in this database, but your database has 10,000 pictures in it. It'll take a very long time to go one by one. It'll matter probably less in the case of a 7-Eleven that you find them quickly, but the longer that it takes to solve a case, the less likely that it is to be solved. And there are other kinds of crimes, kidnappings, where it's very important to solve it quickly. It raises a question that a lot of civil liberties groups ask, which is about what if the facial recognition software is wrong? What if it misidentifies someone? And I've heard concerns that you know, there will be different error rates for different demographics and different communities? Right, so there's two kinds of concerns to have. What if it's right? Mm -hmm. Should we be using something in a certain way at all? And then what if it's wrong? Even if it's only wrong sometimes, what are the effects of it being wrong? It changes how the police officer will react, which could be good or bad. We want the officer to be safe, but they will be more likely to take more extreme action and to think that they're in danger when maybe they're actually not. So for instance, if it's a misidentification, there is research out of MIT where dark skin is not as likely to be correctly identified as light, particularly women with dark skin, not as likely to be correctly identified. There are also general concerns about the effects on, on anyone from any community of just knowing that the government may be tracking your face, may be watching you. Even if I trust the government, I do care. I would rather live in a world where I feel like I have some privacy, even in public spaces, that not, not all is known. Because if people know where you are, you might not go there. You might not do those things, even though they are things that are bedrock of what we think people in this country should be able to do. For instance, coming out as gay is less problematic professionally now than it was in the US, but still potentially problematic. And so if an individual wants to make the choice when to publicly disclose that, then they don't want facial recognition technology identifying that they are walking down the street to the LGBTQ center. So there are kinds of membership issues of certain groups in society where we're not as a government trying to stop, or as a society really trying to stop certain kinds of action, we're not trying to stop people from going to church. We're not trying to stop them from going to community centers. But we will if they are afraid of what will the implications be in an environment that is hostile to, for instance, a certain ethnicity or a certain religion. So really it's very difficult to opt out from either government facial recognition or uh or commercial, it sounds like. It, it is very difficult, and that's one reason that it is more controversial than some other things like fingerprints would be, because it can be done at a distance when you don't know it's being done, and in a way that you, it's very difficult to opt out. And some people might, might think that, well, there, there would be some kind of privacy laws or something that might restrict ideas like that. I mean, is there any regulation at the federal or, or state level that specifically uh, regulates facial recognition? I see more happening on the, the local levels, state or city, right now than, than at the federal. The federal government has not said, we are regulating this and therefore local governments cannot. And then because of that, we're seeing a patchwork of states and cities thinking about doing something. I wonder, what do you, what do you think the future looks like? It, are we in a period that we will look back on and say, wow, this technology was really unfettered back then, but now we have some protections. Is, is that where things are going, or, or is, is it too late and this is just how it's going to be? There aren't that many companies where facial recognition is their core business, and it's not deeply embedded in what the government is doing and how we're functioning. Even if it were, like, I don't think it would be necessarily too late to say, as a society, what are the implications and the effect that government use of technologies that can be used for surveillance, like facial recognition, can have on other rights? So freedom of speech, expression, religion. Do we want this or not? This is a choice that we're making. And there are a number of ways to say that we don't want to make that choice, or that, or that we do. We should decide as a society. Thank you for joining us, Gretchen. It'll be interesting to see how all this plays out. Good to be here, Tom.